right. You're too kind. You're too kind. Um, thanks, everybody, for stopping by. I know there's a lot of good sessions, so it's exciting that you decided to come spend an hour or so here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this picture here is a place called Conzelman Road. It's uh, just across the Golden Gate Bridge, just north of San Francisco. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. Uh, I do a lot of running up there. Um, it's pretty popular for bikers, just sightseers. You can see you get these great views of the bay and, and the Pacific Ocean. And up here, if you turn around, actually do a 180 from about where this picture was taken, you are about, about eye level with the top of the Golden Gate Bridge. That's pretty neat. Um, it's very accessible, so they get a lot of tourists up there. But you can see it's a pretty gnarly one-way, one-lane road that's pretty twisty, and, and that hill gets pretty steep at times. And of course, if you make a wrong turn, you're going to be swimming. But a couple years ago, it was actually more dangerous than, than that looks right now. The asphalt was pretty chewed up. It was a pretty common place for bike accidents to happen. Uh, bicyclists would, would plant their tire in a pothole, go over the handlebars, and there's usually no fun ensuing. The National Park Service, this is actually part of, the, of, of a national recreation area, they did a really nice job at, at, at cleaning this area up. They, they repaved it. You see the nice new asphalt here. They got you know, brand new marker lines and reflectors, and, and they put some traffic circles down where there's some interchanges, and, and you have these nice guardrails. And to me, I think that's, that's sort of the perfect analogy for security folks. When we think about how do we approach security in environments that are embracing technologies and approaches like Agile or Cloud or DevOps. These, these kinds of things, they're not, they don't adapt well if you think of the traditional security model, which was, tends to be based around gates where you might have a piece of code or an application that would, would be inspected at various points. Someone would decide when, if something got to move to the next gate. Um, if you were to apply that kind of approach to this Consumman Road use case, you'd probably end up with, with stoplights instead of traffic circles, with kind of toll booths instead of guardrails. What we do at Netflix is we take more of that, the mindset of let's move fast and let's stay safe. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I, won't, I won't get too prescriptive just because everybody's different. Uh, Netflix is a unique place. I'm sure every, where you guys work is all unique. You have your own constraints and tech stacks. But what I'd like to do is kind of give a sense of how we think about this problem, how we approach it give some examples of some of the stuff that we've done, and then hopefully you get either get some ideas or maybe get some validation for something that you've already done or are working on. Uh, so I'm Jason. I, I work at Netflix. I'm an engineering director there. What my team is responsible for is the security of the streaming video service. So things like op security, app security, incident response, monitoring, all that fun stuff that we get to work on. Before, I've been at Netflix about two and a half years. Before that, I led the InfoSec team at VMware and spent most of my earlier career as a consultant, security consultant at a few different places. Netflix, if you're not familiar, is, it's a streaming video service. What we do is take the TV shows and the movies that you like to watch and deliver them to you over the internet. Uh, you can watch on pretty much any device you like without ads, without interruptions for one price. That's, that's what we do. So that's introductions. I, so I, I, I'm going to bundle these words together, kind of buzzwords, acronyms, things like agile, continuous deployment, cloud, DevOps. I'm bundling them together not because they're particularly similar or, for example, you wouldn't see an organization doing agile development that is not doing cloud. They can be separated. Each one of these are complex topics that, that warrant their own conferences. I, I bundle them together because, to me, Organizations that are embracing these approaches and technologies um, have certain characteristics. And those certain characteristics make that more traditional approach to product security, it's not as adaptable. I'm going to just call out two main characteristics that I see, both at Netflix and, and from my previous experience. The first characteristic is speed. Uh, this, this handsome fellow is, is a guinea fowl. I don't know if you've been lucky enough to see one of these in person. Uh, he's rushing off to an important meeting. Um, but organizations that are doing Agile, they're, they're moving fast. And you can, you can take that to mean a number of things. Their releases happen more often. Maybe they happen every day, multiple times a day, maybe once a week. 
The release process itself also tends to be collapsed and faster. You don't have this idea of a big bang release where you got to shut everything down for 12 hours, push in new code, restart everything. They tend to have the idea of a one button deploy. And then when I put my security hat on, if you're going to tell me, well, things move fast, everything is changing all the time, to me that means, well, my attack surface is changing. What I see today is different from what I saw yesterday. It's different from what will be out there a month from now. So we need to change the way we think to be able to handle that kind of situation. So that's one characteristic. The second characteristic I would call out is scale. And these organizations that are doing cloud, they're doing DevOps, they tend to be bigger. They tend to be, have more systems, more applications, more engineers, more complexity. You get into the idea of distributed systems uh, and serving a global audience. So we have these two things. And when we, when we think about scale, what does that mean for, for security? There's a lot of stuff, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of things to test, a lot of things to evaluate, a lot of code to review, a lot of developers to provide security training for. So we have speed and scale. So my thesis is that if, if we agree that these kind of new approaches, these new technologies bring along speed and scale, the old way of doing security doesn't fit particularly well with this new approach, what are, what are we going to do about it? So how do we adapt? And then I have basically three ways. I'm sure you could, you could slice this differently, but I'm going to present three things. Uh, first, remember this band? First, I'll call culture. It's the company culture. If your company has moved to uh, releasing every week or every day uh, and moving fast, what they're saying is they want to roll out new features. They want to test new things. They want to be innovative. Is it appropriate then for us as security people to say, ah, oh, well, let's Let's stay with the old way. Let's have our security hammer and let's be Dr. No and let's shut things down and command and control. You're not going to be successful. So I would argue that culturally, security-wise, as teams, we need to adapt. We need to understand what the business is trying to do and let's, let's go along with it. Let's not fight. Second thing is visibility. When things are moving fast and things are really big and you have 24-7, you know, with, with ops or security, you need to have the idea of visibility. You need to know where, do I know where all my systems are? Do I know where my sensitive data is? Do I know where my sensitive code is? Do I know the events that are happening in particular apps that have some kind of relevance to me as a security person? So it's really that visibility throughout that stack, throughout all the different characteristics that we want to know. So we have culture, we have visibility. Last but not least uh, is automation. This is something you probably could have guessed. With large systems, thousands of systems, hundreds of apps, doing things manually, right? having checklists, keeping spreadsheets, you're, uh, there's a meme for that, but you're, you're probably not going to have a good time right? if that's your approach. So automation is kind of that, that third piece. We have culture, visibility, and automation. And that's and that what I want to talk about is you know, how do we, um, I guess, implement that as Netflix? What do we do to combat this idea. Well, not combat. I think combat is the wrong word, but how do we adapt to the speed and scale through these three, these, uh, three kind of approaches? Uh, first, just a little bit of background on the Netflix environment, just to kind of get a sense of, of what we deal with. Um, we, do, we do probably, on any given day, rough order of magnitude, about 200 pushes to production every day. Um, if we're working on something large that maybe works across many teams, that could go up to 500, 600. Um, it's not really bound. It doesn't really have an upper bound. It could be different times of year where that goes lower. But there's a lot of change. We have over 40 million subscribers, and these are paying subscribers, so they're not just free users of the site. They're paying money for the service. They expect it to be, to be available. They expect us to protect their data. We support over 1,000 different devices, which brings a lot of complexity in terms of UI and interoperability. When you think about most sites, what do they have? You have, a, you have a main website, maybe you have like an iPhone app, you have an Android app, so maybe you're supporting a few. We have a thousand different devices. We have smart TVs and Blu-ray players and Xbox that all have a Netflix app. So there's just a lot of code out there, a lot of complexity and interoperability. We also have service in 40 different countries, and that you have the idea of, of localization, internationalization. Also on the security side, you have all these different markets that have their own kind of uh, notions of fraud and risk. They have their own payment instruments. Some places prefer direct debit to credit cards. Some places like PayPal. And there are, there are kind of country-specific ways to pay that we need to be able to adapt to. 
Um, and then we deliver our service from three different Amazon regions. So we're primarily an Amazon Web Services, public cloud. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the idea of an Amazon region, it's roughly equivalent to a group of data centers that are geographically close. For example, Northern Virginia, they have a bunch of data centers, San Francisco, uh, Dublin, Ireland. And those are the places that we operate. And we, we deliver our service concurrently uh, out of those three regions. And we have global replication of, of, of member data to all those regions. Um, and then just pure bandwidth wise, when we're at our peak of usage, uh, about one third of the US download internet traffic is Netflix streaming. So it's a pretty big, pretty big, you know, fast moving service. There's a lot of things changing. So first let's start with culture. The culture at Netflix is something that we hold pretty near and dear. It's, if you want to, if you're interested, you can go to our website. We have like 120 slide presentation about the Netflix culture. It's one of these things that's pretty popular, like HR and recruiting and MBA programs will study it. Um, so certainly feel free to check it out if you're interested. I'll sum it up in, in really a couple words, and it's really freedom and responsibility. Uh, you, with that, what we try to do is we hire really good people that are experts in their area. Then you give them freedom to solve the problems in their domain. And then you also give them responsibility for the success of those solutions to those problems. So there's accountability. There's freedom to do things how you want to do it. But it needs to work. Um, and you'll be accountable for whether it does work. To me, that 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 cultural model works really well with the idea of agile and DevOps and continuous deployment. Um, this is kind of the anti-DevOps culture slide, right? Passing the buck. And DevOps is different things to different people. I won't try to define it, but the way that we implement it, sometimes we'll call it no ops, but the way we operate is we have engineering teams that have maybe two people, maybe have eight people, and the, that team manages one or two services or, or three. So they'll work with product managers in terms of requirements, but they're responsible for writing the code, they're responsible for deploying the code, they're responsible for operating the code. When that, you know, that hypothetical thing goes bump in the night, they're the ones who get called. So it's just that team. There's nobody else. It's, it's them. And when you think about that, you, there's, a, there's a lot of built-in um, desire to write reliable code. Um, they're responsible for all of the, in addition to the requirements, all of what you would call the non-functional requirements as well, things like availability, performance, security. It's not my team's responsibility to find every security bug and fix every security bug. Every team owns their own security of their system. Obviously, we're there to help. We don't expect everybody to be a security expert. That's what we're there for. We also have a performance team that, that, that serves a similar role. But culturally, I think we're set up well for this kind of, uh, these kinds of things. And, and it's another one, too, where if you want to do these kinds of things like DevOps, and, and you'll read about, you know, if, you've, if you've read Gene Kim's book or any of the, the blogs out there, you, you realize it's not really a technology thing. It's, it's very cultural. Um, another thing that we've done is we rolled out a, a responsible disclosure program, I guess, last year. Um, so we, we basically get bugs from external researchers. They report them to us. What we found is that this has helped a lot in terms of letting the engineers understand how their systems might be attacked. Because these are real people out there finding bugs and sending them to us. Um, and then we just got this sign. I just thought it was kind of neat. Um, people will walk by and kind of wonder what's going on. But it's also helped because if most engineers have worked at companies where the relationship with security is a little bit more combative, a little more adversarial, I think this kind of approach helps us, you know, kind of lets the engineers know that we're on their side. We'll just work together. Let's keep things safe. Um, anybody, any Archer fans in the room? Yeah. Uh, I, I recommend, if you, if you haven't seen Archer, it's available on Netflix. Um, <laughs> it's not appropriate for children, but it is a cartoon, but it's very funny. Next is, is the idea of recruiting. Um, how do you recruit for these kinds of organizations? This is supposed to be a Venn diagram, but it's, it, that's the idea. What I try to do when I pitch to a candidate that maybe I'm trying to hire about, well, what is it like to work in the security team? What kind of skills do you need? This is kind of how I think about things. Um, with DevOps and, and, and Agile, you kind of, you know, there's this new, this new term that people will call, they'll say, the full stack engineer, somebody who understands, you know, maybe front end, back end systems. And with security in the last maybe five to 10 years, there's been more of a push towards specialization and less 
less generalists. I actually kind of move the other way um, in that I don't want folks who are really supreme specialists. I mean, those people are obviously talented and those skills are required in a lot of positions. For us, what is successful is someone who has some, who has dabbled in some of these areas. Maybe they've, they've done AppSec. Maybe they've worked in online operations for a large website and they understand how those kinds of organizations work. Uh, they've done cloud. Maybe they've done incident response. That's kind of what we look for. And really the unifying bit in the middle, the idea of development, is I really can't imagine anybody being successful without the ability to write code, without the ability to build tools for themselves, for the team. Not necessarily that they're, they've been full-time developers, but certainly need that skill set. I think of my team, about half of the folks I have uh, at one time was, were full-time developers, um, just to kind of give a sense for how the team is composed. And then sort of the last bit on culture, since we operate with engineering teams that have adopted, you know, agile, scrum, whatever, we actually as a team operate in that mode as well. So we use the idea of sprints. We have a two week sprint model and that's how we organize and prioritize our work. What we found is it's really good way to make what we're working on visible to the team and to the rest of the organization, what the priorities are. This is JIRA, this is what we use for bug tracking and work tracking. You're pro you might be familiar with this kind of three lane thing. Um, it basically represents, you know, what are you waiting to start working on? What are you currently working on? What has been complete in a given sprint? Um, we have per user filters, so it's really easy to click on Jason to see, well, what's Jason working on? You know, what has he completed? What is Sam doing? Um, and then also, this is the, I think it's called Greenhopper or Agile Board. And it has some really nice, easy planning and reporting. We kind of just use it out of the box, but the team has been, um, there's really good feedback on using it. You know, as the team gets a little bit bigger, it's hard to know what everybody's working on, and this provides a really nice way of, of making that um, visible. Speaking of visibility, um, certainly with, vis with, with security, with operations, the idea of visibility is, is, is critical to your ability to, to be successful at, at your job, whether it's, uh, again, knowing where the systems are, knowing where the data is. So I'm going to start with, you know, the idea of, of security dashboards, right? Everybody has a security dashboard. Um, we have a few different dashboards. Um, this right here is, uh, we're actually, what we're looking at here is our Cloud HSM dashboard. Uh, cloud HSM is a service in Amazon that basically provides you a hardware security module accessible in the cloud. It just, I want to talk a little bit about how we think about designing the dashboard uh, and what kind of went into it. What we wanted to do was provide a single place where anybody on the team could go to to get all the metrics and all the data on all the systems that we're responsible for and all the systems that have some kind of security impact, things like payments or or uh, logins. So what we have over here is the idea of a sub dashboard because maybe you want to look at just production, maybe just test, maybe a particular region. We have the ability to drill down to a particular region in Amazon and then also look back. I think we, go, we can go back about two weeks with this interface. Um, up at the top, there are the different dashboards for the services that we're responsible for. So we have, uh, for example, a security intelligence dashboard, uh, VPC, which is Amazon's virtual private cloud, uh, we have our crypto and key management dashboard, DRM dashboard. Um, and then there's also dashboards for other services that we don't operate but have some kind of security impact. Uh, things like e-com, payments, customer service. Uh, for example, we want, we want to know are we having an inordinate number of uh, password reset emails being sent? Um, what are customers calling about? Like are they calling because maybe they've gotten locked out or they have some kind of account problems? Um, are we having problems with our payment processors? We wanted to provide visibility to all that from one place. So this is an example of what we've done. Um, and of course, dashboards are really useful for that ad hoc analysis. Let me, let me go poke at things, uh, you know, and, and kind of explore, maybe look back. But you also, as a security person, you need to be able to be alerted when something happens. So I need to know, hey, something happened, let's investigate. And the way we have thought about alerting because it's a, you know, a pretty complicated distributed system. We don't want sort of random apps sending us emails to random distribution lists. We want, to, we want that to be tightly integrated with the way we do escalations and notifications. So we don't want uh, everybody to get a particular alert. We want the person who is on call to get the alert. And if they 
have chosen to get an SMS message or a push notification or an email or a phone call, that's how we want to deliver that alert. So we have a centralized alerting system that helps us um, do that. And this right here is an example of an, an email alert. And I'll walk through some of, I guess, the design or, or the requirements here. And this is actually a, an HSM alert. So we're looking at the Cloud HSM dashboard. This is an HSM alert. What we do is we want to have a meaningful subject for the alert. And you see here, well, in the prod account in US East 1, uh, we've had an, a, a, a request increase for our HSMs. What that means is the traffic that you expected to have to your hardware security module is actually increased. That might be something to look at. Who knows? This is just a test alert we generated. It doesn't actually represent any real data. Um, but what, what this email does is it shows you what the alert configuration is, like what expression matched that caused this alert to get generated. We also have here, sorry, it's a little bit of an eye chart. Um, but what do you do? Well, I've got this alert. OK, what next? And you'll see it says here, Cloud HSM requests have increased at least 20%. Please check the Cloud HSM dashboard and the crypto key management dashboard. And you'll see here we actually have links to those dashboards. So it's not like, oh, you have to remember, well, what's that URL? What, what link do I click? Um, we embed those links, and we actually have the, a graph embedded, too. So you can kind of imagine if you're on call, you're out, you have your iPhone or whatever, you pop that up. And you can kind of have everything on one screen, and you can kind of decide what you need to do next. Alerts are great for you know, informing you of something you might need to investigate. We all know, though, in security, sometimes you don't know what happened. I need to go, I need to go poke around. I need to investigate. For me, it, based on my experience, if something, if I think something's going on, security-wise, operations-wise, the first thing I want to know is what has changed. Right? If I see something today that didn't exi exist yesterday, well, what happened? Did somebody push a new version of code? Did somebody change the load balancer or you know, some SSL certificate? So we have a tool called Kronos. I, I kind of think of it as a timeline system. If somebody pushes code, that event gets written into Kronos. If somebody changes a firewall config, it gets written into Kronos. You can write your own custom events there. What this screen is doing, it lets you drill in in a particular application, a particular time frame. What this query does is, is just say, hey, let me look at the US West 2 region in AWS, which is basically the Portland region, and look back to the last hour. Show me all the events that happened in the last hour. And you see here I've got about 24 events. So I could look through there, see if anything seems fishy. Does anything there seem like it matches what I'm looking at? So this is a pretty neat tool. But part of visibility is you also want to be able to reach people when they need information, where they need information. We're pretty heavy users of chat, like group chat and one-on-one. And -on -one. Um, so we've, ri we've written a number of different bots, chat bots, that can get different information. So you might be in the chat room and somebody says, oh, well, something looks weird. So I can just run this command. Well, show me all the pushes for this particular app in the last three days or the last week. And the bot will go retrieve that information for you. So you don't need to jump out to some application and, and, and figure things out. Um, so that's our, our chat bot. We have a series of those. Uh, the last thing I wanted to cover visibility-wise, it's kind of interesting. Um, if, if you were at the keynote, you know, Nick was talking some about the NSA. Um, I was actually um, a, a um, was invited by the NSA a couple years ago to, to talk to them at headquarters about cloud security. Um, I probably wouldn't accept the invitation if it was made today, but given some of the revelations. But at any rate, it was unclassified. So, But I basically went there and kind of gave my spiel about cloud security, what I thought. And, you know, they, they were pretty quiet, like not a lot of introductions. I don't, I don't exactly know who was in the room. Um, didn't have a ton of questions, but all their questions that they did have and you'll probably laugh given, given all the Snowden stuff, was about integrity of software. And how do you validate and verify the integrity of software in these kinds of environments? If you're making 200 pushes a day, how do you know what you're running in production is actually what you want it to be? It hasn't been backdoored. What, what has gone into that? And I, I mean, it was a good question. Um, so one of the things we built was a tool called Mimir. And Mimir is really intended to be a deployment automation tool, workflow tool, to help people deploy code really efficiently to multiple regions and multiple environments. As a side effect, what it does is provide a really nice amount of traceability to, to your code. This is the Mimir dashboard. This is an app that we run, my team runs, called Lemur. 
it's basically a tool that tests SSL configurations. So we run this, we run it and test. You see the app name up there. I'm just going to kind of walk through a few screens to give you a sense for how this works. Uh, we use Jenkins, which is a build system. It's a, it's a continuous integration system. Um, and this is the job. You could click in there and get to the Jenkins job. That's how our code gets built. So when somebody ch changes code, a build runs and produces an artifact. Down here it shows what your currently running clusters are. So you'll see I actually have two clusters here. One of them shows version 11, shows down, version 12 is up. So it's showing me this is what you currently have deployed. We only run this in test because it's just a test application. But if you were running in prod, you would also have prod boxes. So version 12 is what I'm running. Let me, let me see what's going in there. So if I click that link, I would get this screen. And this screen, you'll see there, there's the cluster ID, lemur version 12. It has the deployment details. When was it deployed, the date and time, what region, what environment. It has the AMI version. And AMI is also an Amazon term. It's Amazon machine image. You can think of it as the template from which your cluster gets deployed. And also, it has the, the SCM commit. So it has the source code commit that caused this build to be created. The way that most of our systems work is if a developer commits a change, that change will then kick off a build job. That build job will create a new artifact. And basically what you're doing here is saying, well, this, this build was created by this source code change. If I click that link, that pops me into Stash, which is our internal Git repo. And you see what files changed, and you see what the actual source diffs are. This is just kind of a, a, a BS change, just to demonstrate. All I did was change some of the markdown on this readme. Um, but it, you, see, you can see it highlights everything. And then also, it actually links to the relevant JIRA. So if I, mean, I click there, I see, well, there's the JIRA. So what, what you can do is, going backwards, I can see, you know, why do you change code? You have a bug. You have a new feature. That starts in JIRA. That's where we come. That's where we is really the source of everything. Going backwards, then you can see in source code where you actually checked in the change. You can review all the changes. If there were any code reviews, that would also be linked right from there. You can go to the build job that actually generated that code, and then all the way to production or test to see, well, how is that running? So there's a really nice amount of traceability for all that. So it's not really, you don't really wonder, well, well what's on that system? Because it's, it's all very visible. Next is, uh, we'll talk about automation a little bit. <clears throat> i just give a few examples. Certainly, there are lots of different things we do automation-wise. One of the things I want to talk about is canary testing. So when you make a change in security or code, how do you decide whether that change was successful? Like with security, maybe you do a code review. Hey, it looks good. Ship it. But then it goes to production. It breaks. Who knows? The idea of canary uh, testing, you know, if you're familiar with the idea of a canary in a coal mine, um, you send the canary into the coal mine. If the canary dies, well, don't go into the coal mine because there's some kind of gas down there. Um, I feel always felt bad for canaries, but you can take that same approach with testing, right? Let me let me roll out a version that I think I want to use, and let me test it. And I can run a series of tests of security tests, performance tests, regression tests that will tell me, yeah, it looks good, or nope, your bird just died. You know, go back to the drawing board. Now, you have those results, but we, we really want to be able to analyze them automatically. So we built a system that we call the Automatic Canary Analyzer, not a, not a real uh, creative name. But what it does is, for this particular one, it runs a, about over 1,000 different tests to compare your candidate against what's running in production. And the way that happens is, for this particular one, this is our API team, they made a code change. That code change resulted in a build. That build was automatically deployed on a Canary instance of production that received some very small percentage of production traffic. You'll see here it ran for about 11 hours. We gathered all the metrics, over 1,000 different tests and metrics. And then we have an automated engine that gives you a best guess. So this one says 99 out of 100 looks pretty good. You should be OK. You can this gives you a lot better, a lot higher assurance, a lot higher confidence that this is going to work as expected. So you have security tests, you have performance tests, regression, whatever you want. Uh, next is the security monkey. Uh, this is something I've talked about before. I actually talked about a little bit at, at AppSec USA last year. Um, if you're familiar with Netflix's Simeon Army, um, there, we've, we've done some blog posts on it if you're interested, and there's some other talks. What we do 
Because we have this idea of a simian army that has automation and basically automation of conformity testing, of architecture assessment, of security testing. The, if you were to think about that, that old traditional way, how do you validate that, you, you, that your applications, for example, HA architecture is right? Well, maybe you schedule and you go talk to some architecture review board, you whiteboard it, they look at your plans, and then you say, okay, well, yeah, it looks good. Go to production. So we don't do that. We do the opposite. We, we know how to be successful running in the cloud from an HA perspective, from a latency perspective. So what we do is we say, go ahead, you're smart, deploy your code, deploy your system how you want to. Then we're going to test it against our best practices and what we know works. So one of the things we have is Chaos Monkey. The idea with Chaos Monkey was what would happen if a, if a monkey was let loose in your data center and just started pulling cables out? Could your app withstand that? What Chaos Monkey does is it just starts killing random instances. Can your app survive random instances failing from the cluster? If it can, then you know, that's what we expect. If not, um, then you, again, you have, have some work to do. We have a bunch of different monkeys. We have a latency monkey, which will inject random latencies. Like, how does your app uh, work if, you know, you, if, you're, if your dependencies you know, take five seconds to return? Will your code handle that? Will you have a fallback, or will you just fail? Um, and Security Monkey, what, what we use Security Monkey for is primarily Amazon security evaluation and testing. If you're familiar with, with AWS, the configuration is kind of, I, I kind of think of it as stateless in that there's not really a way to track how a particular configuration element has changed over time. For example, a uh, storage bucket, an S3 bucket, which is a container to store files, or, or a security group, which is like a firewall. You can, you can do, call an API to say, well, tell me what that looks like now. But I don't know what it looked like an hour ago or last year. Security Monkey does that for us. It continually pulls and checks and will also alert when things change. Um, it also has a rules engine that allows us to run configs through rules to say, hey, this config looks good, or no, there's some problems here, and can alert us when we see those kinds of things. Uh, this is just like a drill in screen here um, of a security group in our test environment. You'll see here there's a configuration history. So if this config had been changed over time, you'd have a, you'd have a time stamp for each time the change was detected. You can drill in to see what it was like at that time. It's kind of like a time machine for your AWS config. Uh, I'm sure Apple has that, has that trademarked. But, uh, and then over here is the actual, the actual uh, details of the, the, of the config. The last thing I was going to talk about with automation, so I talk, when we talked about Mimir around like software integrity and the whole NSA use case, and I think we have good visibility in terms of what's running in production, but we kind of wanted to take a belt and suspenders approach. So we, you know, we trust the build system, we trust, trust the deployment system. We also wanted to have the idea of like file integrity monitoring. So my next Archer reference, uh, if you recognize this handsome fellow, this is Babu. This is an ocelot from Archer. So we have a system called Babu that helps us do file integrity monitoring. One of the things that makes file integrity monitoring in the cloud or environment um, easy and, and also difficult, we, we implement what has been since named the immutable server pattern, where once we deploy a system, we don't change it. We don't push code to it. We don't push patches to it. We'll just rebake an instance and launch it. So you might think, well, from a file integrity perspective. Well, that should be pretty easy because nothing ever changes. And that is true. But as we saw with the canaries, you, you could actually be running multiple versions at the same time. And if you're familiar with file integrity monitoring tools, you, what you'll do is you'll take a baseline of, of your gold image and then you'll compare everything against that. Well, if you have all these different versions, that's going to fail. So we might have systems that might have a staging cluster, a test cluster, multiple canary clusters. And you want to be able to run file integrity across all those. So that's what Babu does for us. It, it, it helps us basically for any given app, you can have multiple concurrent uh, acceptable baselines for file integrity monitoring. So just wrapping up, again, kind of just to summarize my thesis, is I think these, these approaches, these technologies are, are definitely transformative for security, but also for our organizations. 
in these kind of organizations, you're tending to have a lot of speed, a lot of scale. And I look at the culture of visibility and automation as a way uh, of being security enablers and staying safe in these kinds of environments. You guys, you guys seen Derek? Also on Netflix, really, really funny. It's not also not appropriate for children, but uh, that's Ricky Gervais in the middle. Um, anybody have any questions I can answer? Yes. So how long did it take Netflix to go from, hey, we got a great idea, we're building this, until actually security became you know, very integrated job one? What kind of transition? Was it something you started with immediately, or is it something you had to learn from having shit keyed up in the back? Sure, sure. No, that's a good question. So the question is really around, you know, how long does it take to kind of, I guess, culturally embrace these kinds of things and actually get them implemented? What triggers you have to do that? Yeah. Triggers, I think with with security, so I mean, it actually started a little bit later. Um, I started in, I guess, April of 2011. I was originally hired as an individual contributor. Um, we have an information security team that manages things like uh, employee technology and, and a lot of kind of corporate risk issues and deals with vendors. And they had been previously managing product security. Uh, basically what like engineering leadership wanted was more capability within the engineering organization that, um, because you know operations and engineering, there are kind of different mindsets, so they wanted to be a little more integrated. Um, so we started building a team out. I had I hired my first person about in June of last year. So we kind of went from one person to now we're up to ten. Um, but in terms of I, things, can happen really fast at Netflix, which is why uh, I like working there. I mean, there's not a lot of process. It's that you know freedom of responsibility. If you have a good idea, you can run with it. Um, again, you have the idea of responsibility, so uh, it needs to be successful. Or you know, it, it has that idea of fast fail too. Well, we're, we're perfectly comfortable with trying new things out. If it doesn't work out, then just move on. So, did you find ten awesome people to hire? Did you just from last year? Did I find ten awesome people? I did. I did find 10 awesome security people to hire. Uh, well, nine. So it's me, if, me plus nine. So you're a very developer heavy kind of secondary security, more app security versus people like us who have heavy security. Well, I would say it's a pretty good mix. I mean, if I look at like who I've hired, a um, couple people came from consulting, security consulting. Um, we have a guy who came over from Zynga. He was on their security team. A guy who was at eBay on their security team. Um, the guy from he handled security for the Obama campaign, um, so it's a pretty I mean it's a pretty you know different mix. I mean, I, I optimized kind of for that skills that I had on that Venn diagram slide, but really culture is the most important thing. That's in our interview process. Uh, I'm less heavy on the technical stuff and more about is this person are they the right cultural fit? Are they going to feel comfortable in this kind of environment? How much you, I saw that agile board you have up. Uh, with your team, do you guys do stand-ups? I mean, how, how far do you take it? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, with Agile, so we didn't, we didn't feel the need to be like, let's all get Agile, agile training and, and really understand. We, we wanted to use it more of the, for that visibility. In terms of stand-ups, we, um, we do a weekly meeting. Um, that's either, it's on Fridays. It's either in the middle of a sprint or at the end of a sprint. So we either use it just as a checkpoint or... Um, as like a like, let's close this sprint out. Let's start the new one. Mid sprint and the end sprint. Right, mid sprint. Yeah. One of the things actually I could have covered culturally that has been pretty useful. You, I mean, it's everybody is you know sensitive to how they're laid out physically at, at, a, at when they're when you're at work in terms of your seating. What we did was we moved to like a shared space model, like a, a bullpen model where we're all sitting together. That's actually helped a lot because the team has grown so fast. You have a lot of new people. Um, and it's a pretty complex environment. It's pretty hard to get up to speed. It's, you know, very, like, the engineering tools involved, the systems, it's, it's kind of a lot to ask for somebody to get comfortable with it. But, you know, as security people, we have to know, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but you got to know, like, the whole picture, whereas individual engineering teams just know their piece. Um, so that's helped a lot, too. Look. Yeah, it looks like a presentation like security is um, very much um, operational and automated, which is great, of course, for the environment. But what about the earlier stage, you know, like design, architecture? And do you have any people who are involved at this stage? And if they are the fact of activities that they are going through, is it like threat modeling? Right. Good question. So that's really about 
what do we do, like for the things that can't be automated, design review, like you can't automate getting up at a whiteboard and chatting with a developer on how they're going to handle login. Or, uh, so my team is also responsible for that. And generally we have a, I mean, it's, it's an optional model. If somebody wants help with a design review or a threat model, we're there to help facilitate that. Um, certainly with things that have some kind of regulatory compliance, like SOX or PCI, we're going to be more aggressive there. But if you think culturally, if, if you're making a team responsible for the success of their app, I think the mindset with us is if you have a sensitive app, you're handling sensitive data, and you're not a security expert, why wouldn't you want to engage a security team? Because ultimately, you're responsible for the security of that data. Um, the same thing with performance, right? If you had an app, oh, geez, I'm getting really bad performance. I don't have the, you know, the throughput I want, or my CPU is spiked. If you have a dedicated performance team that they're very knowledgeable in that area, why wouldn't you engage them? So a lot of our work is around that engagement model. How do we make sure people know how to get in touch with us, what kind of services we offer? Um, so we go out to a lot of team meetings and talk about stuff. We have a lot of those. I mean, I would say for us it's more informal. Like we're not, we don't, we're not interested in producing a bunch of uh, artifacts like Word documents that talk about this stuff. We're interested in, in making the improvements to code. And anything that we feel like, well, hey, that was a great solution that we worked on. Well, let's productize that. So we'll work on maybe integrating that into the platform so everybody gets to take advantage of it. So with all the automation, so developers get feedback, something's wrong, go fix it. How do they, is there any sort of uh, uh, lessons learned, or how do other people know not to make the same mistake? How do they know not to make the mistake in the first place? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. One of the good examples was I mentioned the responsible disclosure. So as you would imagine, you know, what's the most common bug we see? It's cross-site scripting. It's the most common bug everybody sees. Once we had the metrics to kind of prove that out, that hey, you know, we get a lot of cross-site scripting, we were working with the teams to fix these things, but then we introduced uh, like encoder libraries and sanitizer libraries that would just kind of take that problem away. Uh, we did some training and, and some pretty heavy documentation and tutorials and test cases on how to use it. And then just engage from a prioritized perspective, like who are the teams that need this most? The teams that have seen the bugs, the edge services. So that's kind of how we would think about that kind of issue. Um, but you can, I think you can, translate that to other security use cases, like say key management or um, traffic management, those kinds of things. So we'll, we'll generally, we don't want to do a ton of work just for the sake of it. We want to say, okay, well these guys need this help. Let's do that, but from there, let's do a deep dive. Let's go do a talk to the rest of the engineering group. Let's make some wiki pages. Let's build some tools and use that as an opportunity because we, we feel like that's proven the need for it. Now let's, let's evangelize it. I think there was one in the back. Can you offer any insight on how Netflix can directly compete with Amazon while renting Amazon hardware? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a good question. So the question is really around um, competing with Amazon. Because, I mean, the thing about it is with, with Amazon, they, they do have a video service. Um, I mean, in tech, I mean, co competition is and, and cooperation, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Like Google is on iPhone and, you know, there's, so there's a lot of integration. We actually, our CEO did a, did a keynote at the AWS conference last year, and they, they addressed that in terms of very early on in the relationship, our CEOs talked to each other, made sure that they were mutually comfortable with the arrangement. Um, and it's, a, it's been a really good relationship in terms of really, when you think about it, we have, we have some other talks that go into some more detail, but if you want to use public cloud at the scale that Netflix needs to use it at, they're, they're really the best out there. So you mentioned having integrity checks over the software that's supposed to be running in various versions. How do you make sure that everything gets on the system on the record so you can do that integrity check? So to do the integrity check, how do you make sure everything is there in terms of the tool to do the integrity check? Yeah, or? Let's say a developer wants to spin up a new service. Can he go push it out there without enrolling in the system that's getting it validated? Oh, yeah, no, that's a good question. So like the idea of, hey, can somebody put some rogue thing out there that has bypassed something? Uh, yes, now, could they do it? Yes, they can do it. We don't put up a gate to say you can't push out something else, but that's where we would rely more on detection. And that's one of the really nice things about the cloud and AWS is that you can't really have the idea of a developer has got a server under their desk that's serving traffic uh, because you can't really hide from an API, right? If I say, well, show me all my servers, 
Because like for that particular use case, I could easily do a query to say, okay, show me everything that's out there and show me that the base image that it's based off of. If there's any discrepancies, that would be, become immediately available. So I think we're all, all out of time. But I thank everybody for showing up. You can catch me later if you have any questions I wasn't able to answer. Thank you.